I'm Noel Latif, President of the Foreign Policy Association, and I am delighted to welcome you to this year's Hasib Sabag Distinguished Lecture on Diplomacy. Hasib Sabag was a visionary philanthropist and businessman who embarked upon many diplomatic initiatives. His daughter, Sana Sabag, follows in his footsteps. Sana is a director of the Foreign Policy Association and an eloquent uh, advocate for cultural diplomacy. It gives me great pleasure to invite Sana to formally introduce our distinguished speaker, Ambassador Nicholas Burns, who will deliver this year's uh, Sabag lecture. Sana. Good evening. We are delighted to welcome Ambassador Nicola Burns tonight, who will deliver the lecture tonight in honor of my father, Hasib Sabak. Ambassador Burns is the Roy and Barbara Goodman Professor of the Practice of Diplomacy and International Relations at the Kennedy School at Harvard University. He is also the founder and faculty change, chair, sorry, of the Future of Diplomacy Project and the faculty chair of the Project on Europe and the Transatlantic Relationship. Ambassador Burns is also the director of the Aspen Strategy Group. He served in the United States Foreign Service for 27 years until his early retirement in April 2008. Ambassador, Ambassador Burns, was Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs from 2005 to 2008. Prior to that, he has served as the Ambassador to NATO, Greece, and the State Department spokesman. He also has worked on the National Security Council, where he was the Senior Director for Russia, Ukraine, and the Eurasia Affairs and Special Affairs to President Clinton and Director for Soviet Affairs in the administration of President George H.W. Bush. As you can see, Ambassador Burns' career spans many administrations and the most senior posts in the State Department. We are very lucky tonight because he is going to speak on the topic of the State of the State Department. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Burns. Thank you. Sana, thank you very much. That was a very kind introduction. I'm grateful for it. And I'm very grateful uh, to give this lecture in honor of your father, Hasib Sabah. He was a legendary figure uh, in the Middle East and here in America, a bridge. Uh, between the Palestinian community and the United States. And so I'm grateful for this opportunity and thank you for his legacy. And Noel, thank you uh, for your service as president um, of the Foreign Policy Association and for the invitation and for what you're doing, uh, both here in New York, but also around the country to stimulate interest in foreign policy. A lot of friends here tonight, really happy to be in New York. Uh, sometimes when I come to New York, I feel like I'm behind enemy lines because I'm a fan of the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> we have to be good winners, as we, we tried to be when we won the World Series last October, and now I have to be a good loser. The Yankees just beat us three straight in the Bronx, so uh, we'll see what happens by the end of the year. But I'm delighted to be here, looking forward to talk to you about the state of the United States State Department. It's a subject very dear to my heart. I spent 27 years uh, in the United States Foreign Service, stationed in Washington at the State Department and at the White House. I also served in Mauritania, in Cairo, in Jerusalem, in Athens, in Brussels. A wonderful career. My wife and three kids and I would not trade it for anything. And it's at an important crossroads right now, and that's what I want to talk about this evening, the future of our diplomacy and the future of our foreign policy. I didn't think I'd, in a normal year, in a normal time, in a normal administration, you wouldn't think someone like me would need to come to New York to make the following statement. 
America needs a strong State Department and a strong Foreign Service to succeed as a global power. That's an elementary statement. It speaks an elementary truth about what has made America great. And we are truly a great country over the last century as we've emerged as the strongest power in the world. But that idea is now under contest. And it's being debated by those who say that America can, in effect, retreat from its global responsibilities. That we can kind of live on our island here in North America and not be involved in the problems of the world. That's not a very responsible attitude to take, but it's a prevailing attitude in certain parts of Washington, D.C. We're the most powerful country in the world. For those of you who are not American, I'm trying not to be arrogant, but objective in stating the truth by any metrics of power, however we measure it, the leading military power in the world, the country with enormous political influence, the country with the strongest and most innovative 21st century economy, the country with enormous soft power, the cultural attractiveness of this city, of Silicon Valley, of our democratic tradition, of our democratic values, of Martin Luther King, of everything that truly made America great. In Princeton nearby, there's a professor I admire very much, Professor John Eikenberry. And he says there is an international system there's a vast labyrinth of institutions and laws uh, and, and values that have made the liberal world, world order that Franklin Roosevelt envisioned and Eleanor Roosevelt and Harry Truman and Dwight D. Eisenhower envisioned that made it the jewel of the last 75 years that held the world together. And Professor Eikenberry says, there is such an international system and the United States is its system operator. Think of it, that in practical terms. We have been, since the Second World War, the great coalition builder on climate change until recently, on human trafficking, on organizing the world against drug cartels and crime cartels, on organizing the world on the new threat of cyber crime and cyber espionage and cyber hacking, on global public health as we seek to eradicate polio, and malaria, and we can do that in the next 10 to 20 years on nuclear stability. Think of it this way. There are 195 nation states in the world. There are about 7.6 billion people in the world. And the United States, our presidents, spend a lot of their time organizing coalitions to defend that 7.6 billion people, those people, from the worst that can happen and to advance the positive opportunities we have to make the world a better place, more just, more secure, more peaceful. So as a matter of self-interest, as well as a matter of principle, America needs to engage the rest of the world. And the rest of the world needs to feel that its strongest country is with them in these fights, these battles that we are contesting to have a safer, and better, better world. All of our post-World War II presidents, from Truman and Eisenhower, to JFK, to Ronald Reagan, to the Bushes, to Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, all of them believed one thing. What made us great is that we believed we were the world leader. We believed we had a stake in the future of the world, and that we had to involve ourselves, not as the world's policeman, but as a guarantor of its values and of its security and of the peace. But my major message tonight is that for the first time since the Second World War, we are not leading as we have since the Second World War. Under President Donald Trump's leadership, we are retreating from major international agreements. I'll just name three, but there are many more. From the Climate Change Agreement of 2015, and I listened to my millennial students at Harvard. Every one of them from every country on earth believes that their greatest challenge for the next 50 or 60 years as they lead us forward is going to be climate change. We've withdrawn. As the second largest carbon emitter in the world, our message to the rest of the world is you're on your own. 
We've withdrawn from the Iran nuclear agreement. And whether you were for it or against it, I was President George W. Bush's Iran negotiator, but I supported President Obama in his negotiations with the Iranians. And I supported him because he shut down their plutonium uh, processing plants and their uranium enrichment processes, the two routes to a nuclear weapon. He did it with IAEA verification. He did it with Russia, China, Britain, France, Germany, and the entire international community on our side. And now we've withdrawn. And we have no influence over that very important process. And the third example I'd give you is the fact that there are 68.5 million refugees and internally displaced people in the world today. That's the highest number since the summer of 1945, when the world had been blown apart by the two-front war of the Second World War. And the United States has always seen itself as a country that would open its doors to legal immigration and to legal refugee processing. And suddenly, we're cutting immigration acceptance, legal immigration acceptance, in half, and cutting refugee admit admittance by two-thirds at a time of greatest need. The message to the rest of the world, to Canada, to Sweden, to Germany, is you take the refugees, we will not in our land of immigrants and land of refugees. We are in retreat of many of our international agreements. We are a less committed and less reliable leader of the NATO alliance. We just two weeks ago in Washington celebrated and commemorated, and I was there for this, the 70th anniversary of NATO. It's always been under American leadership, and suddenly we've become the chief critic of NATO, not its chief supporter. We've been a less reliable leader of our East Asian alliances, equally important in the 21st century as our NATO alliances, as we sanction Japan and South Korea, and don't give them the attention that we give some of the authoritarian countries in the world. The president is trying to dismantle the global multilateral trading system that Eisenhower built, that Ronald Reagan built, that the Republican Party always believed was in the best interest of the United States, free trade, that lifted billions of boats from the 1950s so just a couple of years ago in the unprecedented global prosperity that has defined the post-World War II era, the president said no to Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's 40% of global GDP. And it was the big power move by the United States and Japan, by Southeast Asia, by Canada, by Mexico, by Peru, by Chile, to say to the Chinese, with its predatory trading practices, Beijing, you cannot be in our free trade agreement in the Indo-Pacific until you play by the rules. We left that agreement in the president's first week in office. We said no to the US-EU free trade agreement. It would have been the largest in history between the two largest economies in the world. We deconstructed NAFTA and demonized it and then built something remarkably similar to it with a different name. He very unwisely is saying no to free trade. And I think most importantly for Americans who believe that what really makes us different, special, unique, if you look at our founding documents and founding fathers and mothers, our belief in the rule of law, our belief in human rights, our belief in democracy, we are not leading in the great existential fight underway in Europe. And that's the fight of the democratic countries against the anti-democratic populace. Marine Le Pen in France, Geert Wilders, in the Netherlands, Alternative for Deutschland in Germany, Viktor Orban in Hungary, the Polish government, all taking their countries, trying to, in an anti-democratic direction. We are not just not supporting Angela Merkel, Emmanuel Macron, Theresa May, Justin Trudeau. We are embracing Viktor Orban, the Polish government, Matteo Salvini, the Italian fascist leader in the governing coalition. We are flagging in our faith that the United States has to lead. That the United States has to lead first and foremost in concert with our democratic allies. And I think to go back to that immigrant issue, 
to think of your Statue of Liberty in this city and its message and to think of the fact that all of us as Americans have an individual immigrant story in our own families or a refugee story in our own families, how can one conclude that we are not leading as that immigrant refugee nation when we separate families at the southern border, harass asylum seekers, legally approaching our borders as international law advises them to say that they are in danger of political persecution. We denigrate and demonize those seeking refuge from the storms of Central America and the wars of the Middle East. America is facing, as a result, the greatest crisis of global leadership in our lifetime. And all that is happening at a time when the world needs America to keep the planet spinning, to safeguard us from the threat of war and the most terrible weapons of war. That's been the job of American presidents since 1945. Our government has three essential sources of influence in the rest of the world that defines American power that can help us recover our strength and purpose in global politics. First, we continue to benefit from our great and powerful and best organized military in modern history. We must be careful not to weaken it because the security challenges ahead for the United States in the next two decades may be just as challenging as the last two decades beginning with 9-11. We are facing with the Chinese a race for technological supremacy in military arms that will be fueled by artificial intelligence, quantum computing, machine learning, biotechnology. We may witness, experts say, in the next two to three decades, an extraordinary revolution in technology so that maybe by the end of our lifetime, some of us, a carrier battle group will be obsolete, an F-35 fighter jet, obsolete, a ballistic missile, obsolete, as an entirely new generation of military technology takes its place. Who's gonna win that battle? for military supremacy. The Western democratic countries are China. China has one major advantage. It's an authoritarian country with an authoritarian government. It can reach into any research lab in China. It can reach into any Chinese company and say, I want that software, I want that IP, I want that patent, I want that engineer to work for the People's Liberation Army. Quite appropriately, the United States government does not and should not have the right to tell Amazon and Google and Apple that its technology must be given to the United States military. We have to have a consensual relationship between our tech companies and our government, and I hope all of them will want to work with our military so that our democratic nation is not outpowered and outmaneuvered by an authoritarian nation in likely the most important public policy issue of the next several decades, how we handle that single issue. With that as just one challenge, and I haven't even talked about containing Putin and responding to the fires in the Middle East and protecting our country from attack, this is not the time to decrease and diminish the defense budget of the United States. We are in a very dangerous period of global history. That's our first source of influence. Our second source of influence is the US intelligence community. And in that cyber hybrid AI world, there is a special premium for a country to field the best intelligence services in the world. I worked closely with our intelligence community throughout my career. And I can tell you we have the best funded and most capable intelligence community in the world, but it doesn't happen overnight. You need to encourage people to go into public service, you need to fund it, and you need to be the head of the technology curve. The third source of our influence is the heart of what this program and lecture is about. Diplomacy, the State Department, the civil service of the State Department, and especially the American Foreign Service, which is nearing its centennial, the modern foreign service created by the Rogers Act of 1924. Despite its obvious importance 
to the United States and to our future, the State Department and the American Foreign Service is the least well-funded, by far, even on a proportional basis of the three sources that I've talked about, military, intelligence, and diplomacy. Just when we need our diplomats the most to counter Russia and China, to figure out a way to put a broken Syria back together after this horrific war of the last eight years, to stop the North Korean nuclear threat, to deal with an unstable and dangerous Venezuelan crisis, to cope with the unknowable impact of Brexit on our relationship with our closest allies in the United Kingdom, NATO, and the European Union. Just at this moment, we find to our dismay that the State Department and the irreplaceable American Foreign Service have experienced a dramatic loss of senior leadership, a loss of confidence, and a loss of morale. There are at least five major challenges that the State Department and American diplomacy must overcome in the decade ahead as our future presidents, future secretaries of state, seek to revive a once great institution weakened and damaged during the past two years. And that first challenge is the damage done by the Trump administration to the American Foreign Service. From the first months of the administration, it has been abundantly clear that the president cares little for the State Department, its mission, its career services, its men and women. During his first year, several of the most senior career diplomats with 35, 40 years of experience were summarily fired in the first several weeks of the administration. Many more resigned, in fact, an historic number resigned in disgust and disappointment as they were not asked to work in the Trump administration. There continues to, to this day to be a record, record since well before the Second World War of vacancies in our ambassadorial ranks and in the most senior positions in Foggy Bottom in Washington. During the Khashoggi crisis of last, winter, uh, last autumn and this winter, we had no American ambassador in Riyadh and no American ambassador in Ankara. During the North Korea crisis of the last two years and the president's summit meetings with Kim Jong-un, no American assistant secretary of state for East Asia, normally the senior official who is the architect of our policy towards arguably the most important part of the world. In 2017, we saw a record drop in the number of young Americans registering for the Foreign Service exam in our meritocratic system. We saw that the Trump administration took in only one third of the number of junior diplomats into their first year, as all administrations normally do in an annual, in an, in a calendar year. The president has tried for two years running to take a sledgehammer to the State Department budget. He tried to cut it by 30% and our foreign service is only 8,500 people with a relatively small budget. In 2017, he's tried to cut it in two th by 23% uh, this year. The silver lining that I can point you to is that a virtuous coalition of senior Republican and Democratic committee chairs in Congress have blocked the president in two years successive to restore full funding for the State Department because they believe in diplomacy. Morale is at its lowest in the four decades since I started as a lowly intern at the American Embassy in Nouakchott, Mauritania in the summer of 1980. This is a very serious crisis for the United States, the acknowledged great power of the world, its once great foreign service ignored not funded and not promoted. President Trump, secondly, has accelerated a trend towards the militarization of our foreign policy ranks and the politicization of our foreign policy ranks. He has failed to appoint a career diplomat, a uh, senior career diplomat, to the senior ranks of the National Security Council. He has appointed only a few senior diplomats to the senior ranks of the State Department itself. Only one 
of our current five undersecretaries of state is a career foreign service officer. Surprisingly, none of the most important uh, assistant secretaries of each of our regions for Africa and for East Asia and for South Asia and for Europe and for Latin America, only one of them uh, right now is a career foreign service officer. Uh, to, as a point of comparison, when Condoleezza Rice was Secretary of State uh, in 2005 and six and seven, five of the six most important regional assistant secretaries were career foreign service officers. At the same time, the president has turned to retired and active duty military officers to fill those major ambassadors, ships, many of them, that have been filled, and to fill the senior ranks of the White House staff. I worked very closely with the military in my career. Uh, I am an admirer of our military and a supporter of our military, but I think many retired admirals and generals would be the first to say, uh, we need civilians in our career foreign service to be promoted and to be given the opportunity to serve at the highest level. At the same time, the president has continued a trend since the Kennedy administration of appointing many of his friends and financial supporters to those major ambassadorships that have been filled. He is not alone. Every Democratic president has followed this practice. Every Republican president has followed this practice. Since President Kennedy, uh, roughly 70% of our ambassadors have been career, and about 30% have been political appointees. I certainly have met my share of great political appointee ambassadors. I'll name three who are New Yorkers. Ambassador Craig Stapleton, a close friend of mine, terrific ambassador to the Czech Republic and to France for President George W. Bush. Ambassador Cliff Sobel, a New Yorker. Ambassador to the Netherlands and to Brazil for President George W. Bush. Ambassador Caroline Kennedy, someone I respect greatly, an outstanding, effective American ambassador to Japan. I am not suggesting that the United States should not reach into our society to leading business people, leading foundation presidents, university presidents, uh, to fill out our ambassadorial ranks. But I am suggesting that this post-World War II period of, of appointing nearly all of our ambassadors to Europe as political appointees, to Britain and to France and to Germany, high time we re-engineered that. Why not 90% of our career, our, our ambassadorial position, positions filled by career officers, maybe 10% by friends and financial supporters of the president to capture those Americans who have a unique opportunity and ability to serve. But we don't ask civilians to, to be generals in the Middle East. We don't ask civilians to lead our carrier battle groups in the South China Sea we need trained professional American foreign service officers to lead our more, most important embassies. And this is a bipartisan issue that we should be advising our future Democratic and Republican presidents to undertake. Finally, let me say, we need to elevate diplomacy to the first ranks of how we think about our engagement in the world. When I worked for Secretary Colin Powell, what a great man, who had been 35 years in the Army and then four years Secretary of State, two years National Security Advisor for President Reagan. He used to tell us the proper way to think about American power is to put our diplomats on point with the military and reserve. I think what happened to us after 9-11, and it was understandable, we were hit hard, especially in this city. We reversed it. We came out swinging. Two big land wars, eight years in Iraq, then we left. Now we've had to go back in because of the Islamic State Caliphate. Nearly 18 years in Afghanistan. It's time for us to lead with diplomacy again with the military in reserve. I think there's a consensus in the military about that. I know there's a consensus in the, of, of that in the career ranks of the American Foreign Service. But it's time to put diplomacy first in a complicated, complex, world. We have to do that in a way that banishes two words from our political and global lexicon. Unilateralism. We can't be an island. America can't be alone. We can't go it alone. And isolationism. 
which of course, as all of us know, uh, is an ugly part of the American DNA. But how can one be isolationist in a world where the fate of all of us is dependent on the fate of the other seven billion in the world? When cyber and the prospect of nuclear or chemical or biological attack or AI or synthetic biology are bringing us ever closer together, we have to be engaged and we have to lead. Winston Churchill understood that. He talked a lot about responsibility when he was British Prime Minister during the Second World War. And there was an extraordinary moment in the middle of that war, September 6, 1943, when FDR asked him to go up to Harvard, where I teach now to receive an honorary degree uh, from Harvard University. And after he received his honorary degree, he stood in Tercentenary Theater, right at the Memorial Church steps, Widener Library in the distance, 6,000 American cadets, young men and young women, training to go into the military to fight that two-front war. And it was an important metaphorical moment. Britain had been the leading global power for about a century and a half. It was clear by September 6, 1943, that the United States had become that great global power. And so I kind of think about Churchill standing in Harvard Yard giving a speech that day, handing the baton of leadership, global leadership, to those young men and those young women training to go off to war for the United States. And Churchill gave a long speech, and it was also an important moment in that war because the Soviets had defeated uh, the German Sixth Army of von Paulus at Stalingrad. Montgomery and the British Eighth Army had defeated Rommel at El Alamein, west of Alexandria in the Egyptian desert. The United States had successfully invaded and occupied Sicily. The Italian campaign had begun. Mussolini actually was going to fall two days later after Churchill stood in Harvard Yard. And at that moment, Churchill's central message to the young Americans was, the price of greatness is responsibility. The price of greatness is responsibility. You want to be great, and we are counting on you. This is the message. You have to be responsible, not just for your own affairs, but for the fate of the rest of the world. And he went on to say this. One cannot rise to be the leading country in the civilized world without being involved in its problems, convulsed by its agonies, and inspired by its causes. That's Churchill's message to us 77 years later. That's what Truman and Eisenhower embodied. That's what Ronald Reagan believed. That's what all of our presidents until now have believed. And we can be that country again. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Burns, for those really inspiring and sobering remarks. Uh, Ambassador Burns has very graciously agreed to take questions. So if you could keep it to a question, uh, who would like to start? Start right there. There's a mic in. Please identify yourself. Uh, my name is Mark Reedy. I work for a company called Gragey Capital Research, but I'm also a former Foreign Service Officer. Thank I, you for I your service. I, thank you for your service. I didn't, I didn't make it 27 years. I spent four years from 2008 to 2012. Those were tough years. Uh, they, it was an interesting, <laughs> interesting time of life, for sure. Um, so in your statement or discussion about the state of the state's department, one of the things that I noticed is you, you speak a lot in terms of almost the state is responding to external forces. And I see this a lot of times in uh, agencies when, I, when you're young, you learn basically whenever you're besieged to stop and think, why am I being besieged by the world as opposed to looking at external actors all the time? And I'm struck a little bit the State Department and, and the way you frame it is, well, there's a turn against global engagement and the State Department is the victim of that turn, which may be accurate as well for, to an extent, but I think there's also an importance to look within the State Department and look what the State Department has done poorly, what it has done wrongly. Um, I think of many times whenever the State Department says, why aren't we the lead but in fact actually has been pushed from a leadership position because of lack of confidence in the way they've been running things. So in this context of this question, 
Unfortunately, my service in the State Department actually was profoundly disheartening because I sort of came to see it as a, to use the apple analogy in New York, a shiny red apple on the outside that inside was actually quite corrupt with quite a few worms and basically was often very self-serving. And I'll say from the beginning, whenever I joined, I was told at the onset that the needs of the service are the number one priority. And so this mission that you speak about as the State Department pulling away from this mission, in fact, actually, the State Department might do well to look within and consider how its promotion, how much of the time is spent not on the mission, but on internal politics, internal EERs, lobbying for your next job, lobbying for your... My question is, my, this, is, this, is a, this is a comment and a question, because it's, my question is whether or not you think... All right, I'll let you, you can pick the question out if you like to out of it. This is obviously a challenge in a way, but I, I feel it's important the State Department be challenged at some points. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, serving in the State Department. I just make a couple quick points. You're right that any institution has to uh, be in a continual um, mode of reform uh, and, and evolution. Uh, and you just can't real. I'm not saying we should go back to, to the practices of 1955 to be great. We've got to be a 21st century institution. And some of our best leaders, um, some of our best managers, Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, Madeleine Albright, whom I served, very focused on management, not doing things the way we've always done them, being entrepreneurial, being accountable, point one. Point two, I wasn't arguing in my remarks that it's a shame the State Department's not leading and that others are. I'm arguing that the United States is not leading under President Trump. I served Republican presidents and Democratic presidents. I was nonpartisan. That was our constitutional oath. We're not going to get involved in politics. And I wasn't when I served. It's the first time I've ever criticized an American president like this. It pains me to do it, but we're not leading. We, the country, are not leading. That was my message, not that state has been robbed uh, of leadership. I would also say um, I would never use the word corrupt to describe the State Department as you did in any way, shape, or form. That's just inaccurate. And I, I would ask you just to reconsider. Think about that word. That's a big word. Uh, we may be imperfect, we may be wrong at times, we certainly are. I was wrong many times in my career about what we should do as a country, but I would never use the word corrupt to describe our great public servants. And when you talk about the needs of the service, which you criticized, that's kind of the central ethic of the Foreign Service and the U.S. military. When you enter into service as a civilian or military officer, you will go wherever the United States government needs you to go. You can't say, no, I don't want to go to Paraguay, or I don't want to go to Paris, or I don't want to go to Baghdad. You have to serve, as you did for four years. So um, I would uh, disagree with you on most of what you said, but I honor your right to say what you said. Right here. Uh, you mentioned in your speech that, that you mentioned in your speech how important it was for the tech companies to support the military. And um, it's been in the news lately that a lot of uh, some employees of certain tech companies have made them not support the military. So what do you propose as a solution to that? I think there has to be, um, you know, there have been so many issues, cultural business between Silicon Valley and the United States government. You remember the cell phone, the San Bernardino terrorists, does the FBI have the right to investigate the phone, what's inside the phone? And now we have larger issues. Over the next two decades, will our greatest scientists and engineers help the United States government to evolve militarily or not? The great glory of our society is that the U.S. government should not be able to compel anybody. And, and many of the companies have stood up to say they want to help, but there are debates in others uh, among the employees. And so I think what we need is leadership. Leadership in Washington to understand a different culture. It's a two-way street. Uh, and leadership in the tech companies to understand that they are American. Uh, and that their basis is in this country, even if they're globally oriented as multinational corporations. I think we're beginning to see a change uh, in many of the tech leaders who've been reminded of this and who understand these responsibilities. So I'm not pessimistic about it, but it is an initial hurdle that we have. I don't know who's ahead and who's behind. There are so many different races. Quantum computing, that's the ability to break any code. 
if you gain the advantage in quantum computing, you can't safeguard any secrets or patents or banking information from criminals. Uh, artificial intelligence will revolutionize probably space-based uh, military technologies. So this, the stakes are about as high as they possibly could get. And I think it's just that working away at this conversation between official Washington uh, and Austin, Texas, Raleigh, Durham, all of California, Cambridge, Massachusetts, New York, are big tech centers in the United States. And we've all got to be part of that conversation. I'm not, I'm not pessimistic about it. I think we're probably heading in the right direction. But wanted to note it as a big challenge for us. Thank you very much for your remarks, which I greatly appreciated as a China and India expert myself. Could we, um, one of the, I agree with your points that this is an unprecedented change in American, both domestic and foreign policy approach since the post-war era. Um, one of the things that has helped keep the U.S. domestically on a relatively same path is the court system. And I wondered, given that the military is currently favored uh, in funding over state, could it be that the military serves as our international de facto um, representative of status quo or post-war um, consistency? Could you talk a bit about that, particularly as it relates to rise of China? Yeah. Um Thank you, really good, thoughtful question. I, I guess I'd say, first of all, I think our institutions are holding, our court system, our intelligence agencies, our law enforcement agencies, despite the abuse to which they have been subjected in the most brutal way, they're holding. And uh, the United States is undergoing a form of existential crisis, but we're gonna get through the crisis because the institutions, and the institutions are not marble buildings, they are men and women, and they're holding. Point one. Point two, um, I don't, I'm not arguing that the State Department should have an identical level of spending as the Defense Department. We spend about, if you include spending on the two wars that we're still fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, we spend about a $750 billion a year in the military. That's more than the next seven strongest military powers spend together. But I still think we can't reduce the defense to budget, budget appreciably given the new threats on the horizon, you may know that from 2001, 9-11, until last year, it was the policy of George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and in his first year, President Trump, to say our single greatest threat is terrorism. President Trump, I think, rightly changed it and said our, our single greatest threat is the aggression and assertiveness of China and Russia. So we've got to be able to take that on. Here are two figures, so we spend $750 billion on our defense, we spend $54 billion on our State Department, AID, and all of our foreign assistance. I'm just saying, please give us at least 54. Don't cut the budget, that 54, by 30%. We have about two and a half million people in uniform, active duty and reserve. That's a big military, we need it. We've got 8,500 foreign service officers. We're a very small service. If you cut the budget by 30% or reduce by two-thirds the number of first-year junior officers you bring in, then that problem is for that year, but it's also year 10, year 20. Anybody who's run a business understands this. You don't have the middle-level middle manager, middle level managers or senior managers decades hence if you don't invest in your seed corn. The young women and young men who want to come out of Columbia, and Georgetown, and Princeton, and Harvard, and all these other great schools, Stanford, and be in the Foreign Service, and now we're not taking them in in great numbers. So that'd be a second comment. Your, your question, we could probably organize an entire course uh, at any university around your question, uh, but those are, that's an attempt just to get at a little bit uh, of what you talked about. Thank you.
Excellent. My name is Chris. I really enjoyed your remarks. I'd love to hear any thoughts you can share about how a, a future administration might approach reversing some of the steps in foreign policy without exacerbating any sense of whiplash among our uh, friends and partners. Yeah. So I think we're in an abnormal time. Um, and I think that any uh, plausible Republican successor to President Trump in 2020 or 2024, any plausible Democratic successor, any plausible independent candidate who could get elected will govern in a completely different way. I think most people who are involved in government on the foreign and defense policy side would agree with the statement that we've dug ourselves a pretty deep hole in terms of our credibility as a leader. You're out of the climate change agreement. You're not taking in refugees and immigrants anywhere close to what we normally do and should do, et cetera. I think that any logical successor will not follow the policies of President Trump, number one. Part of what we have to do in government, there's two things we have to do. One is to defend. And, you know, military officers, foreign service officers, we're really trained to defend, which is why Neil called my remarks sobering, very correctly. Defend, it's a sobering thing to think about cyber attacks, hybrid warfare by Putin, the dramatic effects on our environment through climate change that we're surely are experiencing and will continue to experience. The other thing we have to do is advance. Advance the positive opportunities. This is a pretty elementary lesson, right? I had to learn it from my wife, Libby. Three or four years ago, she made the big mistake of coming to a talk like this that I gave at Harvard, and the, they asked me to say, what are the big challenges in the world? And it was all about the negative, terrifying challenges. And we were walking home in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I said, how'd that go? And there was a pause, and she said, you're depressing everybody. Uh, <laughs> and I said, I said, what do you mean by that? She said, I get that there are a million problems out there that we, the global leader, have to take on. She said, but what are you hopeful about? Surely there's some positive trends. That was such an insightful thing to say. <laughs> and I couldn't believe that I hadn't thought about this. Uh, and so what I do every year is I pull my students on that question. So last semester I had, I think, 70 students from 21 countries. This semester I have 52 students from 16 countries. They're from all around the world. And next week, I'm going to send them an email saying, tell me analytically the five or six global trend lines that you believe are positive, that could improve the human condition. What are they? Don't tell me what you wish for, you know, universal peace among all people. Tell me what, you, what can be achieved. Here's what comes back. Every year for four years, these millennials from all over the world say poverty alleviation, number one. We've now lifted about a billion people out of poverty since 1980, since Deng Xiaoping started his extraordinary economic reforms of China. It was China, India, Sub-Saharan Africa, Brazil, where most of it has happened. It is the greatest alleviation of poverty in the history of the world. It's happening right now. Nick Kristof has written about it. Steve Pinker of Harvard has written about it. But we don't read about it in the New York Times most days, or the Wall Street Journal. Number two. Global public health. I follow Bill Gates. I subscribe to his blog. He's a really smart guy. Bill Gates says, I'll just pick out three things he's been talking about. We can eradicate polio in the next three to five years. It only exists right now in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Nigeria. It's a question actually of just vaccinating a small number of kids in remote villages in those three countries. Polio will be gone. My mom was a polio victim in 1949 before Dr. Salk's vaccine. Millions of people have either died or have been crippled by polio. We can wipe it out. We've not eradicated a global disease since smallpox, and we're just about to eradicate polio. Bill Gates says we can eradicate malaria in his lifetime. He's a young man, 63 or 4 years of age. I think that's young. Po uh, malaria, which last year killed about 500,000 kids below the age of five in Africa alone, malaria wiped out. HIV, it hasn't been conquered. It's now more a chronic disease for most people than a deadly illness because of the presence of antiretroviral drugs. Enormous progress in global public health. And then last semester, number one was women. The rise of women, 
opportunities for women. And it's not just my female students, but it's my male students, millennials, from all over the world, even those who live in traditional societies where they're not seeing opportunities expand in a great way for women who say, they look at Denmark or Norway or Germany or the United States increasingly and say, that's who we should be. And I'm a father of three millennial daughters. That's powerful. And finally, on every poll every year is technology. And this gets to how you look at the world. I kind of see, maybe because I'm older, the dark side of technology. How can, you know, and Bill Gates wrote a terrific essay in, a, a year ago in Foreign Affairs about the dangers uh, of genetic editing, gene editing. But there's also a positive side. My millennial students see the positive side of technology. So I give you hope because my wife would want me to do that. But it also informs us. You know, we, we have to sometimes in our history defend, but other times we can marshal our efforts, our energy, our money, our government to advance. And our students want to advance. That's a glorious thing. So I wanted to give you some hope. On that note, <laughs>